Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, coming at you on the 11th of August 2024, though I'll probably release this a day or two later. Anyway, um, it turns out George Orwell um, was not wrong at all, was he? No. In fact, you know, if you can feel that vibration, that's George Orwell spinning in his grave. I think he's spinning so much in his grave at the moment, it might knock the earth off its axis. And if he spins any more than this, he'd probably uh, knock the earth uh, so much that it'll that it will just probably fart its way out of the entire solar system at this point, right? That's the thing. And you know, I was actually thinking um, today, um, of course, I don't know if this meme is, uh, is going to be a crime or not. It is just satire and it's not meant to, uh, I've got to have the caveat about bloody everything now and I know this meme is only to amuse people and it's not there to incite anything destructive. But what the hell, got to show this anyway, right? This, uh, as you can see, is how I see George Orwell's 1984 novel, um, and of course, how Keir Starmer sees George Orwell's 1984 novel. He probably thinks, because it was written by Eric Blair, it's Blairism, and he probably thinks it's an instruction manual by Eric Blair, because he probably thinks Eric Blair is somehow related to his mentor, Tony Blair, you see, and um, he's uh, trying to get in a good old Tone's good books, and he, you see, that's what it looks like to me, you know? <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. He thinks 1984 is actually a guide to Blairism, right? On steroids, of course, right? And you'd, uh, using that. So, so yeah, this is um, what I see that is happening at the moment, and um, it is pretty sinister, isn't it, eh? It is pretty sinister. But um, anyway, uh, one of the things, though, of course, that does bother me and concern me very deeply at the moment, right, is that they appear to be coming after Douglas Murray. Now, Douglas Murray wrote, um, he wrote the book The Strange Death of Europe, and in a couple of recent interviews, he was actually talking about that he has warned, you know, everyone what could happen, and, um, you know, he's in basically just like George Orwell is in don't say I didn't warn you mode. Um, Douglas Murray is very much in don't say I didn't warn you mode himself as well. Um, a lot of people could see this coming. Now, the thing is, of course, that uh, I think it's really obvious and a no brainer at this point, right? That um, if I'm you know, in the Philippines and if I was in Costa Rica, that I must be very comfortable being around people who are foreign to me. I must be really comfortable being in alien lands, and of course I must be really comfortable being the only white in, as far as the eye can see, and you know, not even not knowing that many expats. I mean, I know less expats here than I did even when I was in Costa Rica and I was hanging around with the Americans. Yeah? So um, I'm, like I say, I'm not bothered about people being a different race from me. I'm not bothered about being in alien cultures. That's um, not, not really an issue. What I am worried about, of course, is being in places where crime is increasing, where ideological balkanisation is happening, not just between the indigenous people and foreigners, but within the indigenous people themselves being split like that in two different social classes, where one lot of people appear to be being persecuted more than um, the other lot, and of course a third lot as well. And um, this, is, uh, this is honestly, uh, you know, deeply, deeply concerning, you know? And for me, well, to be honest, I don't mind whether I'm somewhere foreign. I don't mind whether everyone is a different race to me or not. The one thing is that I don't want to be living in a part of the world which, you know, is kind of like um, under some globalist utopia experiment by elite people, um, you know, that they haven't really thought out properly, haven't really thought the consequences of that, haven't worked out the far-reaching implications of, unless, of course, they are Machiavellian, in which case they probably have. And, um, you know, so the, the, I look at the state the UK is in, and I think that, no, I, if anyone asked me, you know, if anyone's asked me a few years ago, right, oh, well, um, I'm thinking of going to the UK, I've never been, um, what do you think? And I say, yeah, you, you like it, go in the summertime. Um, especially probably avoid August because it can be a little bit too much but if you could go there in say sometime between May June July when it's warm though the weather's a little bit unreliable go to the countryside go to Wiltshire go to uh, Somerset go to Devon go to Cornwall um, it's lovely there lovely 
green rolling hills. Um, you know, at that time of the year, it's so green, it's almost like you're in the tropics. You know, um, there's some lovely walks. There's a wide range of different types of terrain that you can walk in, but um, avoid the crap towns. You know, but there's plenty of lovely villages that you'll be able to find scattered here and there in the countryside. And there's a lot of lovely architecture and great heritage that you'll see. And it's extremely photogenic as well. And you'll love it. Uh, that's what I would have said before. Now, if someone now asks me and says, uh, no, I've not been to the UK before. I'm thinking of going. I say, what? Are you insane? No, don't go there. If you value your sanity, if you value your safety, just... Give it a wide berth. You'd be better off going to North Korea at this point. What, are you suicidal or something? Are you mad? That's what I would be tempted to say now, of course. You know, And it all happened very quickly, didn't it? Yeah. So that's uh, how I, I look at the difference you know, between then and now. And one of the things, of course, is that bothered me recently, of course, is they've come after Douglas Murray. And I say that, uh, I think it was Alistair Campbell, actually, chief spin doctor in the Blair administration. Um, you know, I had to say, pff, uh, not, not, I say, not one of my favorite people, to be honest, and that's just putting it mildly, but I'm putting everything mildly at the moment because I, you know, I don't want to stir hatred. I don't want to incite violence. I don't want to come across, uh, you know, bad. I'm trying to conduct myself with very good manners, right? But of course, uh, you know, th there's lots of people who are going after him now, just like they're going after Elon Musk. Douglas Murray, when he wrote The Strange Death of Europe and he wrote um, The War in the West and he wrote The Madness of Crowds, he has been forewarning people for quite a long time, you know, about how, you know, the demographics change and the fact that it has been quite badly managed, not just in Britain, but of course all across Europe. Um, is actually going to cause problems and it's going to actually cause society to become you know destabilized and he mentioned something like that you know what they're going to have to do are they going to bring the police in to deal with it maybe he said they're going to have to bring the army in to deal with it maybe but um it may it come to a point where the people have to rise and you know because he said that they were accusing him of inciting stuff he was just forewarning um about things this is the thing and he's been doing it for a very long time i mean you know just just how do you get this silly woolly thinking of these crazy people these crazy alarmists how far back do you go do you have to go back to the early 2000s and um arrest the kaiser chief for, for their song i predict a riot do you have to go back to uh like the late 70s and early 80s and resurrect the corpse of Joe Strummer from The Clash for the song White Riot. Do you have to do that? I mean, just how far back do you have to go? The fact is that, uh, you know, we are in the situation that we are in now. Um, I cannot, um, you know, f I, I'm, I'm utterly disillusioned at this point. I did not want to see the UK go the way that it has gone. I would love for it to go back to the way it was. I really would. You know, um, once upon a time it was, you know, I think it was, well, it's always been a bit difficult there. It's always been difficult if you're in the lower orders of the UK, but it was quite a relatively civilised place and a genteel society, you know? And um, I have these memories. I have these memories of these um, sweet old ladies, right, who were, uh, and, um, you know, grannies, if you like, who, when I was about, what, five, six years old, um, I think there was a couple of them that lived next door and a couple of doors away from my... Uh, from where we were living in that council estate. Um, and of course, you know, our next door neighbor, I think uh, next door neighbor's mum and her friends used to come around and there were these old ladies. And you, when you actually think about old people, when I was a kid, when I was about five or something like that, old people back then would have been born between 1890 and 1915. So, you know, the changes, what they would have seen, the oldest of them would have been born before flying was invented. The youngest of those old people back then would have been born at a time when um, well, flying had been invented and actually um, aircraft had been used in World War I. But they would have been born at the peak of the British Empire and they would have seen quite a lot of changes in their lives. They survived World War II, you know? And then you get onto World War II and what do you see there? People fought and died to prevent Britain from being overthrown by a very oppressive fascist regime. This is the thing. And people fought and died for it. And they would, and they had such steely resolve. And, uh, God, you know, and then, of course, you know, you, you, when you think about it, there was um, Winston Churchill. Now, love him or loathe him. It, he was a proper cometh the hour, cometh the man man at the time. And, um, you know, Britain became very desperate at one point. But Winston Churchill basically 
had managed to stave off the Nazis, um, you know, in time for when uh, um, the Americans finally joined the war. And when they joined the war, they needed a base, and the only base that they could really f feasibly use in order so that the British and the Canadian and the, um, you know, the American and the other troops could take Europe back by going into France. The only way of doing it was that Britain was still not conquered. Right? Had Britain been conquered, Ireland was neutral in that war, and so they wouldn't have been able to use Ireland. And even if they were in Ireland, they wouldn't have been able to, it wouldn't have been so easy for them to retake the continent because Ireland is so far away from it. Whereas England, you know, its nearest points is very easy to get to. So that's the difference. So we have, um, you know, to bear in mind the fact that I, being born in the early 70s, have grown, grew up in that post war era where, you know, we were told that people fought and died for your freedom. We were also told that there's people on the other side of this iron curtain and they don't have freedom and we do and we ought to be thankful for the freedom that we've got. And now this. And it's just really sad and it's really, really disappointing, is it not, at the moment, you know? So this is the thing that uh, does actually make me sad. So, you know, and even, I've even heard that they want, that they even talk of wanting to extradite Americans to England for, for posting stuff online. I actually went um, onto uh, the Black Belt Barrister's page to find out, um, on his uh, YouTube channel, I mean, to find out whether or not they could do it. And in order to be extradited um, from one country to another, you have, it has to be illegal in both countries uh, what you have done. And as America has got free speech enshrined into its First Amendment, it would actually be extremely difficult for the authorities of um, the UK to extradite uh, Musk to um, the UK to, you know, to put him on trial for inciting or whatever. Now, you know, there are people saying that, um, you know, that Elon Musk has been inciting all this bad stuff and spreading misinformation and, uh, and you know, and uh, goading, you know, uh, Britain and all of that and meddling. But no, I don't. Th I think this is just a bit too. I think this is just a bunch of myopic, hubris-filled bollocks. And I believe it's open to debate. And I think that we should be able to have this debate. In my opinion, Elon Musk bought Twitter and turned it into X because, at great expense to himself, because he believed that freedom of speech was being taken away. You know, and he said that the, what, the, what the world needs is a public square. It needs a public square where people can be free to say what they like. And, um, you know, it's inconvenient. It's awkward. But at the same time, you work out who the wrong ones are. You can identify who the wrong people are very easily um, because they're not underground. And my real concern with censorship myself, you know, that I have at the moment is that you don't get the, you only get one narrative if, if they do this. If they decide they're going to shut down all the other narratives and the only opinions and the only, that you're allowed to have are state sanctioned opinions from only one perspective, then, you know, that's extremely dangerous. And I don't understand how it can be that people don't understand that it's extremely dangerous to suppress all the other opinions. Unless, of course, they're Machiavellian and malevolent and evil and power crazy and power hungry and have no conscience. And, you know, then I don't, apart from those people, of course, and I wouldn't like to think that our rulers are like that, would you? No. So, if we assume that they're benevolent, then we have to think that maybe they're just a bit naive and misguided, you know? <clears throat> and that's um, where, it, where it comes. That's, that's what I would like to believe, but I'm finding it harder and harder to believe that this is the case, you see. So, yeah, I mean, you know, writing a book uh, warning people about what could happen to Europe if it carries on doing what it's doing and, um, you know, trying to alert uh, people who have power and influence, you've got to change what you're doing because if you don't, then this is going to happen and then it happens, you know? And the fact that they deny two-tier policing, they, they come out and say, there is no two-tier policing, I mean. But then, you know, but the overwhelming evidence of our eyes, which they want us to deny, George Orwell mentioned this in 1984, did he not? That, you know, they want you to deny the evidence of your eyes. Now, 
yes, there's AI, yes, there's deep fakes. But at the same time, you know, there's so much talk, and I've not just found this out on X, I've found this out on GB News and Talk TV as well. They're talking a lot about this. Even Sky News were asking about two-tier policing. And I mean, the Sky News are quite a mainstream channel, aren't they? They're, they're not really all that different from the, uh, from the BBC in that case. But, you know, when, um, when Sir Mark Rowley came out of the Cobra meeting, as you know, he uh, did, he came out of the Cobra meeting, um, a member of Sky News um, actually uh, asked, are you going to end two-tier policing, sir? And Mark Rowley grabbed the microphone out and, um, you know, I don't know if he threw it to the floor, but um, that was not a very nice thing to do, was it? You know, I mean, uh, you've, got to be able to you've got to be able to control your temper if you're in such a high position, you know? You can't go taking it out on journalists, and especially not if they're mainstream journalists as well. You know, this is the thing. Mainstream journalists are supposed to be your mouthpiece. You know, if it's alternative or citizen journalists, well, I can understand they become dissidents, don't they? But this was Sky News, so have a butchers at this clip. Are we going to end two-tier policing, sir? Now that's really not very good optics, is it? I mean, that's the thing, that's not very good optics. And they've been extremely vengeful, extremely threatening and very sinister ever since. And, you know, since, um, I don't know, Keir Starmer's come into power, it's like the, the country's run by very threatening, very sinister, we're coming after you, vengeful, authoritarian people. Now, you know, as I say, I'm not here to incite hatred. I don't want to do that. I would like to see people talking about stuff. You know, there's that old, um, there's that old cliche, I don't know if you've heard it, it was attributed to um, Winston Churchill, the old phrase, George Orr is better than War War, he said, apparently, right? And it's true. So I personally think that there is a solution um, to this problem, right? And that is that people need to learn how to to talk, but when I say they need to learn how to talk, I think disenfranchised working class people who've been given a real bog standard state education for so long and have become so demoralised and so marginalised and so sidelined and they've, they've just basically let themselves go. They look like they've become dysgenic, they sound like they've become cognitively impaired. They, they've, they've, it's not their fault, I don't think. I think the fact is that they've just become so demoralized and so sort of like lacking in any self-confidence and self-belief over the years especially since britain used to um, have a manufacturing base and has lost it it used to it'd be a great industrial place it used to be a great place for coal mining it's uh, you know it, it was the first modern industry in the world and was the place that created the blueprint of industrialization and modernity that we know now everywhere in the world. Literally every country in the world has got to thank Britain for inventing all of that, that created the world that we know now, right? And now the, 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 the area where it was created, the north of England, is a horribly depressed, you know, how can I say, uh, demographically, politically balkanized hellhole right, that has just been burning down recently through people writing and, uh, you know, the, the roots of, the root cause of all this is deep, deep roots, very, very deep roots indeed. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it was inevitable that stuff like this was going to happen one day and it's been building up for a very, very long time and it's a shame. So, you know, as I grew up on a council estate myself, as I grew up in the working classes myself, what would my advice be to my fellow working class people. I would say there's one thing you should study, the trivium, right? Now, I haven't really gone into much details, but the three principles of the trivium are actually, um, you know, easy to understand. So anyway, I shall go over to a text bit and some pre-recorded information, and I'll come back here in a minute. Number one, grammar. Grammar is the first component of the trivium and serves as the foundation for learning. In this context of the trivium, grammar refers to the study of language and how words are used to convey meaning. This includes understanding the rules of language, such as syntax, morphology and semantics. By mastering grammar, students are able to communicate clearly and effectively both in writing and in speech. Number two, logic. 
Logic is the second component of the trivium and focuses on the principles of reasoning and argumentation. In the context of the trivium, logic includes the study of how to think critically and how to evaluate information in a systematic way. This includes learning how to identify logical fallacies, analyse arguments and construct valid reasoning. By mastering logic, students are able to make informed decisions, solve problems and think critically about complex issues. Number three, rhetoric. Rhetoric is the third component of the trivium and focuses on the art of persuasion and communication. In the context of the trivium, rhetoric involves the study of how to effectively communicate ideas and influence others through language. This includes learning how to craft persuasive arguments, deliver engaging speeches and use language to convey meaning effectively. By mastering rhetoric, students are able to communicate persuasively, engage with others effectively and present their ideas in a compelling way. Now, this is the thing. I think it's really important that working class people self-educate themselves by learning about the trivium. Firstly, you know, I know that being common in England is uh, popular amongst the working classes and when people get together in groups, they don't want to appear to be too smart around each other. So they, they feel obliged to act thick, you know. They ain't necessarily thick, but they feel obliged to act thick in front of their mates because of this kind of tall poppy syndrome or there's this sort of, uh, you know, crabs in a bucket syndrome. If you become articulate, you become educated and you talk to your mates, so a lot of the time people feel that they're obliged to say, oh, oh, you swallowed a diction, really, or you think you're better than the rest of us. If they could get over that, if the working classes could get over that without, um, you know, without, uh, what to say, losing your identity as working class people. This is very important. I mean, other working class cultures in the world can do this because they're not divided against the middle class quite in the same way as they are in England, being as England basically has got a, a sort of what I would call a civil cold war that's been going on for so long. It's become so normalised into the society, people don't actually realise it's a civil cold war. I'm not even talking about ethnic minorities here, I'm talking about between the working classes and the middle classes. The middle classes utterly hate the working classes. They see them like vermin, wish they were all dead. They don't like them being there and it's a, you know, and then the working classes have kind of retreated into this post-industrial failed world that they live in where they don't have like they don't feel like they have much to live for and uh but still they can uh, go down the pub and they can still have banter with their mates and the middle classes are so socially repressed they can't they're so constipated they can't deal with the reality and the grittiness of the working classes that's the thing right so I would argue that every working class person needs to learn these things, you know? You have to learn about grammar. You have to learn about the cor correct um, use of words. You don't necessarily have to talk like that with your mates, but it's very important to understand this thing, to educate yourselves about grammar. Learn how to use words correctly, properly, not necessarily use big words, you know, no. Um, only use big words if it's necessary because it cuts a lot of other you know, words out and you need to be super specific then yeah use your big word but no word salad no no you need to be able to speak in plain english but you need to be able to speak in plain english in a very sophisticated way it's very important once you do that then you know what you're doing you see the thing is that, that because they don't teach you the trivium it's basically like um i don't know how can i say they teach you language but it's like it's like, it's like giving you a bunch of sharp objects and not teaching you how to use them safely, right? See what I mean? That's the problem. Again, you know, the second bit that I mentioned in there was, um, you know, logic. Logical fallacies. Now, logical fallacies are quite easy to spot when you go online and you type logical fallacies and you learn all the different names of logical fallacies. Now, I've done this myself. There's things like, as I say, setting up a straw man. That is someone who puts words in your mouth and sets up a false argument to accuse you of saying something that you haven't said. Once you spot a straw man, you can do something about that. You can then say, you can then point out how you've been taken out of context and you're not going to continue this conversation anymore unless you acknowledge the fact that you have misrepresented what I've said. Otherwise, I'm not going to carry on this conversation with you, right? That's one very important thing. There's the one where it's like they know 
True Scotsman fallacy is another one as well, because you've got the uh, people that say, oh, you don't put salt in your porridge, you can't be a true Scotsman, right? You could say that here in the Philippines and say you can't be a true Filipino if you don't like eating rice, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, that, again, is not true because the person actually is a true Scotsman regardless of their taste in what they do with their porridge or even if they like porridge or not, right? See, I'm, I'm a, a Gael, I'm a ethnically Irish. They do have a tradition of sticking... Um, salt on their porridge over there but i put sugar on my porridge does that mean i'm not irish anymore you see what i mean right and then of course there's the uh, the obvious one like the ad hominem and the ad hominem is where instead of addressing the argument someone just makes a personal attack on you right in order to provoke you um you can then once you know an ad hominem you can then point out and say i'm sorry but that was an ad hominem that's not actually a proper argument you haven't addressed my argument once you start talking like that to people then that's very important as well and of course in the age of woke people say something like oh oh but that's how people used to think we don't say that anymore you have to move with the times and then you can say to these people well that's an ad, nom ad novitatum which basically means an appeal to the new an appeal to the um to the novel you know i believe that's called ad, ad novitatum right you can point out that that's the name of the fallacy that they are using and as a result just because something is new and just because it's fashionable and just because people are doing that and you never used to do it that's not an argument in and of itself um you, there's also you know people who might come up to you and say well it's wrong to say that because keir starmer um said it's wrong to say that in which case you can then come back to him that's an appeal to authority fallacy that's not an argument in of, of itself he's still a human being with faults he might not be the right man for the job just because he's got a position of authority does not mean he's right right things like that you know and then someone else says oh, well um, uh, other people have said this about you in which case you say that's an appeal to the crowd, isn't it? Or appeal to the group fallacy. So the more of these logical fallacies you can spot being used against you, especially with the intellectually dishonest middle classes that exist out there, who don't play by the rules of their game and take advantage of you for not knowing these things, a lot of the time these people are actually quite thick. They're thick with degrees. You've got to bear that in mind about the middle class, especially if you're working class. You've got to bear in mind, just because they speak posh, just because they've been at university, just because they got educated, don't mean shit. A lot of the time they can be intellectually dishonest, they can gaslight you, and some of them will be Machiavellian in order to do that because they're evil geniuses, but some of them are actually thick and are just chronically over-specialised in one subject, right? <laughs> And to be honest, I kind of think we've currently got a Prime Minister who's a bit like that at the moment. If you want my honest opinion, I'm not saying it's fact, but um, it does look a little bit like that to me. Right. So once you have good grammar, once you identify fallacies, then you can speak and you can use rhetoric. And when your rhetoric is, um, as I say, persuasive, convincing, compelling, you can talk. You don't have to smash anything up, you don't have to pick up any bottles, you don't have to pick up any bricks, you don't have to, you know, attempt to attack police officers, set fire to vans, none of that stuff. Because you've got the pen being mightier than the saw, you've got jaw jaw being better than war war. The system is stacked against you, you don't have the protection of certain demographics, um, you don't have the protection of certain other races and stuff like that. You're on your own. No one's coming for you when they throw the book at you. The best thing to do is to be very careful and to be very aware about how things work. And then you come to the... the you, you, you be decent, you be polite, you have good manners, and you eventually, you know, as a result of that, can speak and think and talk. And then, once you're there, once you understand all of this stuff, then you get to the point where you can take it on and it happens as a result of debate and conversation now i don't know if this is actually going to work because the problem that we have at the moment is you know when we go down the route of totalitarianism as we appear to be doing at the moment um, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on you have to forgive me it's nearly sunset at the moment and uh they've got the sun in my mince pies I go that way and it bleaches out my face but then if I'm on this side of course it then means that I look too dark I actually like this time of day you know the sun I don't feel it's going to burn me at the moment this is there's a good thing I'll just carry on whatever till I find a shade shaded bit so 
the uh, really important thing though of course is that um, the UK as you know is very class divided and so I feel a comedy sketch coming on here now yeah will they make it illegal for you to use the trivium to um, you know to uh, was it refine your ability to do argumentation while being working class check this out you stand before this court because on many occasions you did willfully, unlawfully, and with malice of forethought, use the trivium in order to refine your techniques of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. This form of intellectual terrorism, which it is in this case because you are from the lower orders, and this type of knowledge is only exclusively available to the elite classes and the upper middle classes, means that you are condemned to be sentenced to public execution. Had you have rioted like normal working class folk, you would only get two years in prison. Therefore, you will be publicly executed in the view of many other working class persons. Any working class persons caught not watching this public execution will also be executed until all of the persons who are averting their eyes are also purged from this society. This type of intellectual terrorism of the lower orders will not be tolerated. Next. Sorry, I just couldn't resist that, you know, because this is the thing, what they're going to say. Yes, uh, you know, thinking while being working class is a form of intellectual terrorism. It wouldn't surprise me, man, if they started going down that road, you see. This is where it all jumps the shark. But you know what? Um, satire and comedy is a very good type of forewarning. Because, you know, if, you, if it's funny and if it's silly, they can't really... You know, what am I doing? <laughs> Inciting humour. <laughs> Don't forget, right, you in the UK, we are British. And humour is our greatest weapon against tyranny it always has been right so being able to laugh is very important it's also good for your soul it actually produces the right chemicals in your body it's good for your health makes you live longer makes you uh, as i say look at me i'm i'm over 50. i got i i'm very happy that i got the face i deserve at this age now um you know i've been around too many frowners and scowlers and didn't want to become one of them myself you see so <laughs> there you go right a bit of humor is always a good thing right so yeah and then just finally as i done that last sketch um i have to talk about the you know what i call the the the, the uh the, the basically the civil cold war or cold civil war I don't know how to word it properly that exists and has existed in a very long time in the uk which is between the middle classes and the working classes right this is a kind of a good opportunity i think if you are from the working classes right because the working classes still have their integrity they still understand the truth at a very basic level they understand the truth they don't um, have to pretend to be something they're not for the purposes of hanging around with a bunch of people who are neurotic and have status anxiety right yes there is the issue of what you call tall poppy syndrome or crabs in a bucket syndrome but all the working classes have to do is to raise their confidence a little bit you know have these conversations with your mates don't be scared to not be thick around each other and then once that happens then of course you know you can take them on one of the good things uh, one of the good advantages nowadays of course is that because of uh, the um midwittery as it were that has entered the middle classes the average iq of middle class people has actually gone down over time because they've they've made uh, how to say university places so ubiquitous and so common these days right that um anyone can get into university it ain't like it used to be when you only had the very best and brightest you know i'd say a good what good 80 percent of them wouldn't make it into mensa right this is the thing so they ain't very bright, they are midwits. The midwits um, are now the elites. Um, the, we don't have the same old, truly posh people that we used to have um, you know, as the real ruling classes anymore. No, they, we seem to have middle-class midwits running the place at the moment. They're not very bright. Um, they're not very astute, they're not very erudite. The, the only thing they have is uh, tricks, intellectual dishonesty, you know, uh, the use of logical fallacies against people who don't understand, um, you know, logical fallacies, word salad, and um, sophistry. 
All you need to remember is that if they say something to you, it's a bit word salady, and you can't understand or make head or tail out of anything they said, it's not because you're too stupid to understand them, it's because they assume you're too stupid and think they're able to bamboozle you with words. But um, if you cotton on to that and understand that, and you are skilled at argumentation and skilled at clear thinking, then you can actually do something about it. So my plea to the working classes of the UK is that you refine yourselves intellectually, you get those three principles of the trivium, you use them, you understand them, and you educate yourself. Now, if you're a self-learner, I've used this word before, you are an autodidactic. It basically means that you are teaching yourself, you are your own teacher. It's the opposite of an academic, right? If you know your own mind and you have a sense of your own sovereignty as an individual and you become self-actualized as an individual and you're an autodidact and you want to learn just for the sake of learning, you have an advantage. You're not indoctrinated into someone else's matrix. You're not basically having someone else do your thinking for you. We need more people to do this at the moment. It's absolutely crucial. George Orr is better than War War. And if the UK is going to get out of the mess that it's in, if it doesn't happen for a long time, it's going to be a very long five years, then the best thing for the working classes of England to do, who are being stigmatised as far right, is become exemplars, behave yourselves, have good manners. There's a lot you can't get away with, and there's no point thinking, why is it OK for them, but it's not OK for us. The best thing to do is accept that that's the way it is. Sharpen your intellects. Use argumentation, use talking, build networks. And that, over time, will be the way through this. I honestly believe that the whole of your reality, if you're stuck in the UK, depends on it. And so, you know, I have to be really careful because, you know, they're threatening to <coughs> extradite people to, I mean, I don't know, they're threatening to extradite foreigners to the UK who speak about the UK in a way they don't want them to now. I think they're going to have to rebuild the British Empire and, you know, how to say, get themselves in a few new colonies just so they have enough room for all the prison space that they're going to need. It's a bit, it seems a bit like that at the moment, eh? Hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you know, but I tell you, I'd like to see them try with the Americans. I mean, you know, let's say, the longer I'm away from the UK, the more I feel like a 1776 American. So yeah, I'm with the Americans on this going, hey, bird, 1776, I'm, I'm with them now. I understand that now, truly do. And of course, if I am a 1776 American, I've got the right accent for it because their accent hasn't actually formed yet, right? So there you go for our American viewers. And I hope I have a few American viewers because, you know, like I say, you're our last hope. You really are our last hope in the Western world at this point. The rest of us have lost that. You know, it's gone. If you go, there is no Western world anymore. There is no Western world to return to anymore. It's, it's over. It makes me sad, man. So, as I say, before I leave, before I am, um, you know, go away, I have to say to you all, be good, be decent, you know? Um, don't, um, you know, be very, very careful with the situation. Do not get yourselves into trouble. Think good thoughts, say good things, do good things. Because, you know, and not because the government demands it of you, but because basically it should be your moral duty to be exemplars. You know, that's the thing. It should be your moral duty to be exemplars, you know. We all have to learn how to be good and we all have to learn through trial and error how not to be bad people. But you shouldn't um, do it because they expect you to do it. You should do it because you want to. You know, that's what it comes down to. Right, I'll leave it at that. Sorry, I'm a little bit waffly droney. But, you know, it's just the time we're in right now. So, see you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.